good day and welcome to Data Scotland. Um, my name is James Frost. I'm the Director of Data Services at Quorum, um, who are an IT services company based in Edinburgh. Um, throughout my career, I've, I've worked mainly with Microsoft Technologies um, and came pretty much the, the traditional route through the, the SQL Server MCSE, um, but I've spent the last few years working with uh, cloud and AI and big, big data technologies. Um, I did a data science master's degree um, a few years back and happy to bore anyone absolutely rigid about that, um, in, in particular my final year project which was using, using neural networks to play backgammon. Quorum are a gold partner, um, we're based in Edinburgh and we do consultancy across pretty much the entire Microsoft stack, um, helping a lot of big organisations with their cloud adoption programmes. And my particular specialism is around the, the, the data and AI side of our business. Um, and again, we do pretty much the, the, the full breadth uh, of data services from data architecture and strategy. Traditional DBA is a service where we can outsource um, management of your database estate or work with your DBAs to, to kind of provide assistance and guidance. Uh, ETL, both with cloud technologies and uh, the, the likes of uh, integration services. Um, master data management, business intelligence, primarily at the moment using a mixture of Azure Analysis Services and Power BI, um, and then AI and, and looking at the, the Microsoft Cognitive Services as well as kind of hand-rolled algorithms. But enough about us, I think you're probably here to hear more about Azure Synapse Analytics. So without further ado, on with the talk. So what's the history? Where did, where did this come from? And, and some people may remember many years ago, a technology called SQL Parallel Data Warehouse, which was really a way of building a big cluster of servers, essentially, that you could run large data queries across um, your, your data estate um, using traditional SQL. Uh, it, it didn't become massive because it was, it was complex to set up and it was incredibly expensive. And that product evolved um, into what became known as Azure SQL Data Warehouse. And primarily that was about making this available um, in essentially a cloud pattern so you could spin this up um, and run that against your on-premise estate. That in turn has moved into what's, what's now called Azure Synapse Analytics. Um, but this has added a number of additional options. Um, the first being serverless. So rather than having an infrastructure sitting there costing you money the whole time, uh, you can have it spin up resources, run a query, and then spin them back down again um, in a very cost-effective manner. It can also be used for both querying relational data in a traditional database, but also a data lake. So if you have uh, text files um, or structured data, um, or even things like image files um, in your data lake, um, and I'll come on to talk about what, what a data lake can provide in this context, um, then Azure Synapse Analytics can connect to that and, and use common familiar languages such as SQL and Python to query that data. Um, and it can also be used as a framework for machine learning. So um, it uses MLlib, which is a Spark machine learning library, but can also integrate with uh, the Azure machine learning service. So what does Synapse Analytics provide? Well, the first is the ability to store huge amounts of data in a data lake. I'm talking absolutely ginormous volumes. Um, and then use Synapse Analytics to query that data, as I say, using standard tools. Um, the tools you can use, you can use T-SQL, um, which I think a lot of people on the, in this session will be familiar with, Python, um, but also things like Scala, um, which is a kind of Spark language, uh, Spark SQL, and .NET. As I said in the last slide, you can have serverless options, which spin up and spin down on demand, um, or you can have dedicated compute. So if there are workloads that you're running all the time, you can define a cluster that just literally sits there and processes its data on a regular basis. Uh, the key is you have flexibility to scale on demand and pay for what you need. Synapse Analytics is also ODI aware. So the Open Data Initiative is a standard in the industry for providing access to data. And there are more than 85 connectors to different data services. And I'll talk a bit about that when we come to, to do a show and tell. Um, 
you can take multiple types of data. So you can take SQL data, text file. The text file might be in CSV or JSON format or Parquet. Um, combined with web services, and you can combine tables in all these formats into a single query, join data from multiple sources, um, and actually use this as a data exploration tool. Um, but Synapse is also a hub for other services, so you can integrate with tools like Azure Machine Learning, Cognitive Services, and Power BI, um, again, to really leverage uh, the amount of data that you have within your data lake. But some people, you know, may be wondering why, you know, what's 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 impressive about a data lake compared to a traditional database system. And the first kind of key difference is the volume of data you can store. So you can store a file in size up to 190 terabytes. Um, that's for a single file, um, and you can have millions and millions of files. And and essentially, um, the, the the limit to capacity is probably more influenced by your budget um, than by the capacities of the platform itself. You can also use a schema last approach. So, so when you store traditional data uh, within a database system, you have to define the schema. You have to define the structure of the tables that that data fits into. With a data lake, you can turn that on its head and you can say, well, look, let's just throw all the data that we've got in CSV and JSON image format, um, some more kind of modern semi-structured data like Parquet, um, let's throw this into a single kind of repository um, because we don't know what we're going to use it for at this point. Um, and you then apply a schema at the time of querying. So as you go to retrieve the data, you say, right, I'm now interested in these particular structures within that JSON kind of file structure. Um, but it also has a very low storage cost. So again, if we, you have a lot of data, maybe archive data or historical data that you want to, to store, you don't think you could use it very often, but you, you don't want to throw it away. Um, a data lake can provide really, really low storage costs. So let's have a demo um, and we will move over to the Azure portal and show us creating an Azure Synapse workspace. So for the first demo, we're going to look at how easy it is to spin up an Azure Synapse resource. Um, I'm here in the Azure portal, um, that's just portal.azure.com. And if you don't have an Azure account, um, you can get a free one. Um, just search free Azure account, um, and you should come up with a page that looks something like this, um, which will give you a 12 month subscription to Azure with some free credit. So um, some services are completely free. Um, some services you have to pay for. Synapse is a paid for service, but you get 150 pounds worth of credit for the first 30 days so it's it's enough to get you up and running have a play and kind of get a feel for what this can do for you once you've got an azure account of some description um, we need to go into the portal and hit create a resource to create the synapse workspace azure has hundreds and hundreds of different services so we need to find we can we can do this via the, the navigation on the left or actually just search so if i search for azure synapse um, and here we have Azure Synapse Analytics, which is the service we want. And all I need to do is hit Create. So this asks for a few things. First of all is what subscription is this going to be created in? Just make sure it's one that has some credit and it's the one that you want to use. Um, and the next question is, is the resource group that this sits in? So a resource group in, in Azure is just a container that essentially just groups together the various resources um, that um, are relevant to a service. So in this case, I'm going to create a resource group for all my data science kind of capabilities, and we'll put Synapse into that along with the data lake, so it's all in one place. Um, and that makes things easier from a management point of view, but it's also a kind of billing uh, structure, so I can see how much is this resource costing me as a whole. So I'm going to create a new one for this. Uh, I'm going to give this a name of RG Data Scotland, and that's available. I get the green tick, so I can hit OK. The next thing it wants to know is what's my Synapse workspace name going to be called? Um, so again, I will be very imaginative with naming and hit SN Data Scotland. And I need to tell it what region um, I want this to sit in. So 
Um, I can pick from any of these Euro regions that, that offer this service. Um, West Europe is uh, the Amsterdam data center. Um, for some reason, that's classified as West Europe and North Europe is in Dublin, which makes no sense from a geography perspective. But um, West Europe is a pretty good, um, it's called a hero region. So a lot of the, the kind of the advanced services uh, arrive in that region first. So um, if you're not specific from a data jurisdiction about being in the UK, uh, West Europe is a good place to start. Uh, I also need to create a storage account. Um, for Synapse to use as it's, it's storing its own internal workings um, and kind of data. So I will just call this uh, DL Data Scotland. And again, that's valid. And finally, a file system for this to sit in. So again, I will just create a new one, uh, file system data Scotland. And we'll have a look at what it creates once we're finished here. The final thing I need to, to provide is a password for the SQL Server admin user. I'll leave the default username and give it a strong password. Uh, make sure this is something that you can remember. And that should be us if I hit review and create. This will just come up with a page that confirms what we've put in. It lets us know what the cost per terabyte. So when we're using the serverless pool, um, the, the the cost is a pay-as-you-go charge, which is currently £3.73 for every terabyte of data processed, um, which in my view is pretty reasonable. So this all looks good. I'm going to hit create. And hopefully, very shortly, we should be seeing the resources spinning up. Um, and I will come back to this in a couple of minutes once it's complete. So a few minutes later, we should end up at the following screen, uh, which shows us the deployment is complete. There's been no issues. Um, and it gives the option to go to the resource group to see what we've created. And what we end up with is a storage account and a Synapse workspace. If you're wondering what happened to the file system we specified, um, we can find that within the storage account. So within the storage account itself, there is a container. Um, and that is the, the file system that, that we created for, for Synapse to do its work. But if I come back, to the resource group and click into the Synapse workspace. Um, this gives us the overview page to um, the, the service, um, but it also allows us to open Synapse Studio from here. So this Synapse Studio is the main um, area that we use to work with Synapse. Perfect. That's us with a um, Synapse Analytic Workspace ready to go. Um, and in the next demo, we'll look at what we can now do with this. OK, the next thing we're going to do, we're going to connect to an external data source. That has a huge volume of data. Um, in this case, it's the New York taxi um, data set, which contains every single taxi journey between, I think it's 2011 and 2019. Um, so we're talking billions of rows um, and let's look at how we query that in Synapse. So we're in the Azure Synapse Analytics workspace and before we start connecting to external data sources um, I'm just going to take a couple of minutes to look through uh, the interface on the left and show us what options we have available. Uh, the first thing to know is if I hit the expand button um, rather than just see these icons I can actually get a little bit more description of what each one does. Um, I'm going to come back to data because that's the, the main piece we're going to be looking at next. Um, but um, I'll start from the bottom. Uh, manage lets us um, configure resources around um, Azure Synapse that it's going to use through its processing. So I can see for a start that we have some SQL pools. Um, there's a built-in, and this is the serverless SQL pool um, that um, Synapse uses. And it, this is the cost per terabyte kind of model. But I could define a dedicated SQL pool that's, that's there available all the time. Um, if you're doing uh, a lot of processing, you might say, well, actually, we, we need something that's, that's sitting here ready. Um, I can give this a name, and I can give it a performance level. Um, and it tells me then how much this costs per hour. So I can scale this anywhere from uh, a 100 uh, DW workload, which is 89p an hour, all the way up to uh, 268 pounds 
um, per hour, please make sure that your credit card is up to date if you're going to uh, configure one of those. Um, I don't need that at the moment for the demo because I'm going to use the, the serverless to show you um, how we can query using that. So I shall discard changes. Uh, we can also define a, an Apache Spark pool. Um, and again, it's a very similar idea. This is a, a pool that spins up on demand. Um, again, I can give it a name. But in this case, um, I configure how many cores I want um, and how much memory I want on each node. And then how many nodes. So I can say, look, I want to start at three nodes and scale this up to 200 nodes um, of, of eight core machines. So again, um, a huge uh, capacity to spend money, but a huge capacity to, to scale resources um, to carry out processing. Again, that's beyond the scope of what we're going to talk about today. Um, but just to show you that um, it's very easy to define an Apache Spark pool that scales on demand from a low number of nodes all the way up to, to a huge number um, as needed. Um, it's worth noting this is this is very similar to Databricks, um, but is far more well far closer to a native Spark pool um, in terms of capabilities. Um, I can also define linked services. So um, I already have um, Azure Synapse Analytics and the data lake storage. Um, but if I click plus, I can connect to a whole range of other external services as well as Power BI. Again, I will come back to that when we're talking about the data itself. And I can as well link to Azure Purview, which is a kind of data classification um, service that lets me do data discovery on my on-premise environment um, and find out things like you know, where there's personally identifiable information within a SQL database, and I can pull all this data into Synapse Analytics. Um, again, that's outside the scope I want to talk to you today, but um, is, is worth doing some digging on if that's an area that's of interest to you. The Monitor tab shows me what's going on. At the moment, um, the answer is nothing. So we'll come back to that when we're running a job. Um, and the Integrate tab lets me pull data in um, from an external source into Synapse. And I'll come back to that in the next demo. Develop lets me run scripts against the data. But the thing I really want to do at the moment is pull some data into Synapse. So I'm going to click on the Data tab. I currently have no databases um, and I have no linked services apart from the data lake storage that we set up earlier. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a new resource. Um, and I'm going to browse the gallery. So um, there are a number of kind of data sets. So if I click to external data, I can pull in from an existing, say, Salesforce connection. Um, but the gallery is quite good because it has uh, a whole range of both data sets, um, which may be of interest to people, um, sample notebooks, which are essentially scripts that you can kind of run against various data sources, um, some SQL scripts, um, and some pipelines. Again, these are used to pull data from one source to another. But I'm going to go to the data sets. And what I'm interested in is this New York taxi and limousine yellow trip data, which is a data set comprising um, essentially billions of rows of taxi trip information um, and it is available uh, publicly which is quite a fascinating data set with a lot of geographic information. So if I hit continue it gives me a little sample of, of what's in this data set. Um, 1.5 billion rows, 50 gigabytes um, and it's 2009 to 2018 so ignore what I said earlier. And all I need to do is hit Add Data Set. And this is now adding um, the data set from this, this open data sort. And that's us done. So I've connected to that 1.5 billion rows of data. Um, and it gives me some default options. So I can run a new SQL script to select some data, or I can run a notebook. So I can work in Python in notebooks, or I can work in SQL. For the purpose of the demo, I'm going to work in SQL, and I'm going to select the top 100 rows, um, it automatically generates this SQL script for me. Um, and I'm just going to hide a few tabs so we can actually read this better. Here we go. So um, this top bit will be fairly familiar. Select top 100 stars. So I'm going to just get every single column from 
And the from is an open data sort, uh, sorry, an open row sort request, um, which connects to this blob storage account, goes to this particular folder, which is the New York uh, taxi yellow, picks year is star. So I can, I can select a particular year that I'm interested in. And likewise, I can select a particular month. So this is this is a wildcard search within that data lake storage capability. And and one thing when you're designing a data lake is you want to think about how do you partition the data so that you can essentially group um, your your searches um, in an efficient way. So I could only select the 2014 data, um, and all the uh, Synapse Analytics will do is go to that 2014 folder and grab all the files from there. These files are in Parquet format, which is a, a, a highly efficient compressed um, form of storage, but in essence, it's similar to a CSV file, um, but with a schema applied. So if I hit run to run this query, and this is now spinning up. So this is not instant. This is spinning up um, a serverless SQL instance. It's going to the data set, it's finding the first 100 rows, and then it will return that. So if we give that a couple of seconds, um, and the first time you, you run a Synapse query will be slightly slower than the next time, so 19 seconds. And I can see the schema, I can see some data that's in um, this table. Um, obviously my screen resolution, um, I will just zoom back out. Um, doesn't let me see a huge number of rows, but there we go. Um, but I can also change this query to say, well, actually, do you know what? I'm interested across those 1.5 billion rows. Um, let's 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 look at a total count. So if I do select count of star, and this is going to go through that entire data set, um, look at every Parquet file. Um, under the hood, um, Parquet files are split out. So if you save a large file in Parquet format, um, it will break it up into into multiple files, so that again, uh, Azure Synapse can run. Uh, essentially spread this workload over a, a huge number of nodes um, and pull the data back really quickly. So again, um, if I hit run here, um, this will take a short while to run. So I will pause the video there and come back to it shortly. And there we go, 49 seconds and we have counted 1.57 billion rows of data. Um, stored in a text format, not a database. So, you know, that's that's still pretty quick for for data, you know, particularly if you, you're looking at using this for, for archive data and data that you maybe are not using all the time. I can run queries, I can get data back, I can run selects, group by, all the usual SQL functions um, across these text formats uh, in a way that should be fairly familiar to folk. Um, I'm gonna show some of the, the more complex kind of SQL types around um, grouping and selecting um, in the next kind of clip where I'm going to pull this data into Synapse so I have my own local copy to work with. For the final demo, we're going to look at how we can connect to an external data source and bring that data into our own data lake um, for essentially archiving and analytics. So the last demo was looking at how can we bring data into uh, Azure Synapse um, and connect to an external data source and copy it across. And to do that, we need to go to the integrate area of Synapse um, and hit the plus option to pick a new integration resource. I have two options here. One is a pipeline um, and a pipeline is, is using the full power of Azure Data Factory. Um, I can connect to multiple um, kind of data services I can then merge them, um, I can do lookups, I can group and sort and filter and run Python scripts. Um, and you know, there's a tremendous amount of power there. But I would recommend for getting started, uh, we just look at the copy data tool, which essentially lets us say where we're getting the data from, where we're getting it to, what format do we want to save it in. So if I hit copy data tool, um, and the first thing it asks is, is task name, I will just leave the default. Um, and then a frequency. So I'm just going to run this once. This is a one-off job to pull some data in from an external service. Um, I could schedule this. So if this is data I want to pull in on a nightly basis, I could hit schedule and say, right, going to this external source and pull the data in once a day. Or indeed you can set a tumbling window. So if you have transactional data that kind of comes in 
um, on a rolling basis, you can say, well, set a window that, that every hour um, goes and gets the last hour's data and brings it and kind of merges it in with the data set. But essentially, I'm just going to pick the run once task. And if I hit next, so now I need to say, where am I getting the data from? Um, it's remembered that the New York taxi, which I'll come back to, but I'll just show you if I hit create new connection, um, this gives me access to all of these external kind of services um, that Synapse supports. So I can connect to um, an Amazon web service, a Cosmos, um, some of the Google services are in here, um, pretty much any database, any modern database system you can think of, Dynamics, um, you can connect to an FTP site, uh, a Google BigQuery store, Hadoop, um, and, and pretty much um, any service you can think of, um, you can go and grab data from. But I'm just going to pick the New York taxi data um, that's in this external blob storage account and say I want to pull data from there. So I need to tell it where the file or folder is. Um, one unfortunate thing, um, because this is a read-only blob store, if I hit browse, it's going to throw me an error um, because uh, it doesn't let me uh, browse that root folder. So I need to give it a starting point, um, which is, in this case, I'll delete the rest of this, um, NYCTLC. Um, and now it should let me browse that resource um, to show me what's within there. And I want to pick the yellow taxi data. And this lets us see a little bit about the structure that's behind um, what we were looking at earlier. This is partitioned by year. Um, I'm just going to pick one particular year um, to pull in um, just for efficiency's sake. Uh, I want to say recursively, so that will look down the directory tree and bring everything in that's, that's underneath it. Um, and I'll leave the rest of things um, at the default options just now. It's now looking at, right, what format is this data in? Uh, it's trying to pass the text format. It's not going to get very far with that because these files are in Parquet, which as I said earlier, is it's just a very efficient compressed format um, for, for tabular data. So if I just tell uh, the copy data tool it's in Parquet format, it should give us a nice preview of the data. Um, and that looks OK, so I shall hit Next. Where do I want to? kind of store this. Again, I could pick any one of these external services, so I could store this on an FTP store, store etc. But the purpose of this demo, we're trying to bring everything into uh, our Synapse Analytics store and the local data lake. So I'll pick the Synapse data lake that we created earlier as part of the, the Synapse creation. And where on this um, data store do we want to store it? Well, if I just hit Browse, um, we've got the FS Data Scotland container that we created earlier and I'll just give it a path under that of NY taxi. Um, the rest of this we can leave as, as, as default it will just take the file names from the source um, so I don't need to worry about that and what format do we want to save this in? Again I don't need to have Parquet to Parquet I could have Parquet to CSV um, or a variety of other sources at uh, JSON um, but I'm going to just bring this in to Parquet. And I've hit next. Um, and there's a few kind of additional logging and data consistency checks you can carry out. Again, I'm not really worried about this just now. Um, so I've just got Azure Blob to Azure Data Lake. And if I hit next, and this should run and create the data set, the pipeline, um, and then carry out the file copy. And that's us done. So that is, we've created a copy job. We've run the copy job. We haven't scheduled this. Um, it's a one-off, um, but we can now go into uh, the, the Synapse kind of analytics side of things and query this data store. So if we now go back to our data area, um, we can see that we still have the FS Data Scotland file share. But this time there is now a NY taxi, which is the, the content that we pulled across, um, and that's from the year 2014. Um, and I can double click to, to if I can double click properly, um, double click to look at um, 
the underlying folders. Again, this is partitioned. So the, the original partition was by year. Um, the data is then partitioned by month. Um, and these are just folder structures, um, but it allows efficient query. If I want to just select a single month, it will only need to go to one folder and pull that data. Um, and we could even see within um, an individual month, there is a series of these snappy parquet files, which is the compressed file format. Um, again, in the background within the data lake, when you put data in, it will break the file up into, into multiple sections. And that lets this, you know, when I run a query against this data, it lets that run across multiple nodes because multiple nodes can go each working on an individual file and then pull the data together into a single source. So this is uh, about 20, 30 meg files. That's about 600 meg um, for each folder. Um, so about six gig, uh, six or seven gig in total across this NY Taxi data set. Um, so again, you saw the speed with which that transition from the original source. And I can go back to my SQL script. I've just uh, in the background repointed that at this DL Data Scotland, FS Data Scotland in White Taxi. So that's the folder that we're looking at. Um, and I can run and get the top 100 rows. Um, but I'll just I'll show you that you, know, you do have the full capacity or capabilities of SQL here. So I can say, well, actually, I don't want a top 100. I want to look at the vendor ID. Uh, a sum of passenger count, passenger count. Unfortunately, you don't get autocomplete at this stage. Uh, as passenger count and a sum of trip distance as trip distance, comma, and a count. Why not? As trips uh, from, and I need to do a group by, just a group by vendor ID. Um, and I should be able to run this. And again, that's going to go across that six gig, um, certainly hundreds of millions of rows um, in parquet format. And tell me I've got an error because I have a semicolon in the wrong place. So this will take a few seconds to run. OK, so 20 seconds. And I've got a summary by vendor ID with a passenger count, a trip distance, and a number of trips, which is essentially a, a row count. Uh, I can even look at this as a chart. So it gives you a few nice uh, visualization tools within the interface to say, well, do you know what? I want to, to look at this by vendor ID um, on a bar chart and compare passenger count and trips. And that is the end of the demos. Thank you very much. So in summary, as we've seen, Azure Synapse Analytics gives you a way of combining both traditional relational database management data um, and big data in a single approach, in a single interface using common tools such as SQL and Python. Um, Typically, areas where you would use this are, are cases where you have a wide range of volume of data assets, but you don't know how they're going to be queried. Uh, Volvo, the manufacturing company, um, used a big data lake approach to just store all the sensor data from their production lines and saved a huge amount of money. I think it was about five or six years later um, when they had to do a recall and they can actually identify all the um, sensors and all the machines that were not in the, in the required tolerances. Um, so, you know, cases where you've got a bunch of data, you don't know what you're going to do with it, put it in your data lake um, so that you can query it in, in future. Um, it's also great for huge data sets that, you know, traditional database management systems struggle to cope with. So when you're talking about terabytes of data and billions of rows, um, a data lake approach can give you the scale um, to be able to, to run queries within a reasonable time frame that would be very difficult to scale on a traditional system. Um, it's also good, and certainly the data lake itself is good for archive data that you're only going to query infrequently. So, you know, don't store everything in your production um, SQL database. Treat that as something that, you know, that's for your uh, frequently accessed high performance data. Your data lake is something that you can store 
the less frequently you know historic kind of clients and data um, just be careful this does not become a data dump or a data swamp um, data lake approach is also good for, for more complex data types so image data um, that you maybe want to run some machine learning algorithms on um, or maybe kind of semi-structured data like JSON documents that have a hierarchical nature and are hard to pick out or pick apart with a traditional SQL database system. And this is also good um, as a staging service for bulk loading into a data warehouse. So if you have data that you want to pull from a variety of sources, stage it so you can do some transforms into traditional kind of star schema. Um, you don't need to do this anymore within a kind of essentially expensive database platform you can pull it into uh, I would say something like a parquet format in terms of text staging within your data data lake um, and then use tools like Azure Data Factory to transform that into your tabular model in your data warehouse so this is a very cost-effective staging service compared to running you know a big beefy SQL server to do that data load and hopefully You've seen throughout the demos that getting this up and running is simple and can be relatively cost effective. So all that remains is to say thank you for the, the time you spent watching this. Hopefully, hopefully you've got something out of it. Um, and thanks as well to the organizers of Data Scotland for um, putting together a, an excellent uh, online event in these challenging times. So, so well done, guys. Um, and thank you. If anyone has any follow up questions or would just like to um, talk to us about what we do in more detail, um, I'm always happy to have a chat. Um, you will get me at the email address above, james.frost at qrl.com. Have a great day.